playing All Cars, the copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling All Cars, Ascension All Cars, broadcast 142. Cover the district around Pasadena Avenue and Avenue 42. And pick up any suspicious person. That's all. Rolls and quit. Are you confused by all this talk about gasoline? All claiming superiority? Then listen to this frank letter from a stranger in our midst. He writes... As a newcomer from the East, I've been frankly bewildered by the many conflicting claims advertised for the leading brands of gasoline in the West. When I heard Rio Grande's broadcast saying, more police, fire, and emergency cars are powered by Rio Grande Cracked wherever it is sold than any other brand, I decided that it was the first really convincing statement I'd heard about any gasoline. I know you couldn't make this statement unless it were absolutely true. And it's obvious that police and emergency cars depend more upon gasoline than pleasure cars. So, I figured if these big buyers, to whom gasoline is all important, prefer Rio Grande Cracked above all others, it's the logical gasoline for me, too. I'm convinced that I'm now using the best gasoline money can buy. Signed, Mr. Matt M. Hammond, 764 South Normandy, Los Angeles. The same reasoning induces thousands of motorists every month to drive into a Rio Grande station and ask for Cracked, the same gasoline the police cars use. They have discovered that Rio Grande Cracked lives up to its guarantee of police car performance in your pleasure car. And now it is our pleasure once more to present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends, and boys at the police camp at Valyermo. The policeman is a public servant. When he takes his oath of office he promises to enforce the laws which the people make. The ideal police force does just this, enforces the law, keeps the peace, sees that the machinery of society functions smoothly and with least friction. The ideal police force does not meddle in politics, does not concern itself with the social opinions of the public, does not interfere in any way with the affairs of the public, so long as the public keeps its peace. It is my constant effort and ambition to attain this ideal. The case you are about to hear tonight deals with an officer who might be called an ideal officer. Using intelligence, his own God-given initiative, he solved a brutal crime and brought the criminal to justice. His reward, of which you will hear later, is typical of the recognition any man under my command may expect for showing the same qualities. It is a few days before Christmas in 1913. In Thurston's drugstore on Pasadena Avenue in Los Angeles, young Harold Zeigler is showing Mr. Thurston his new flashlight as Mrs. Thurston goes to answer the phone. Isn't it a dandy, Mr. Thurston? It sure is, Harold. My dad bought it for me. Ought to have waited until Christmas, oughtn't he, Harold? Well, you see, my birthday comes on Christmas Day, so dad sort of figured I ought to have this as a birthday present ahead of time. Well, that's mighty thoughtful of him. You're liable to lose out with only one set of presents for both days. Yeah. And then Bill White, the motor cop, has been telling me that I ought to have a flashlight when I make deliveries at night. He's right, Harold. It isn't safe to ride a bicycle around at night the way these fools run their automobiles nowadays. Thirty miles an hour down Pasadena Avenue. Wonder they don't break their necks. Oh, Ed. Yeah? Party up on Avenue 42 on some citrate of magnesia. They said to send along change for $20. They want it in a hurry. All right, I'll get the magnesia. You get the change for Harold. Gee, that's swell. Now I can use my new light. Well, you be careful with this money now, Harold. Oh, yes, ma'am. I'd send Robert, only he's home for supper. Don't you worry about me, ma'am. I can take care of it just as well as Robert can, even if I am two years younger than him. Well, we'll see. Here's $19.50. The citrate will be a half a dollar. Take their $20 and give them this money and the citrate and come right back. Gee, Mrs. Thurston, I know how to make change. All right, Harold, here's the citrate. Uh, you better get started. Yes, sir. And don't forget to use that new light of yours. Don't worry, I won't. Uh, 
I wonder what's keeping Harold, Ed. He's been gone over an hour now. I don't know. He ought to have been back in 15 minutes. Do you think he might have been run over by an automobile? Less chance of that than ever before. He had that new flashlight tonight. But it's such an ugly night, raining and all. I'm going up that way and look for him. What was that address? 727 Avenue 42. East or west? West. And I'll be back shortly. Running into a friend outside the store, Mr. Thurston enlists him in the hunt for the missing messenger. Quietly, they walk several blocks through the drizzling rain until... Ow! Oh! What's the matter? Oh, consarn these blooming kids that leave their bicycles on the sidewalk. I'd like to catch that young imp. I'd wring his wait, neck. Wait, wait. This is Harold's bicycle. What? And he's the last kid in the world who'd leave his precious wheel out in the street in the rain. There's something mighty funny about all this. Say... Look across the sidewalk there. What is it? Wait a minute. I'll, I'll see what it is. What? It's a club. A wooden club. Great Scott, there's blood on it. Something's happened to Harold. Listen, Ed. You look down that way and I'll go this way. See if we can find anything else. All right. Call out for him. Here. Harold! 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 Where are you, boy? Harold! Harold! Here, here here's his flashlight. What? Uh, down here in this ravine. Well, he must be around here somewhere. Oh, wait until I get this thing turned on. There. Oh, look. Oh. He's still breathing. Hurry across the street to that house and call an ambulance. I'll do what I can for him until it gets here. Well, Bill, it doesn't look like there's much business for a cop tonight. No. Raining too hard for the second story, man, I guess. <laughs> uh, what did they think about you hanging around this pot bellied stove up here at Lincoln Heights? <laughs> it's okay with the sergeant. Thanks to you, I've got a police substation right here in your hardware store. <laughs> and I've got police protection. It's fair enough. <laughs> Someone wants a pound of nails, I'd bet. Hello? Yeah. And just a minute. It's for you, Bill. It sounds like the sandwich. Oh, thanks. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll get up there right away. Crime on a night like this. Looks like murder. See you later. Patrolman Bill White arrives at the scene of the crime a few moments after the ambulance has removed Harold Zygel. He is met by Officer Harry Glaze. Sergeant sent me over, Glaze. Good. This is a tough one. Let's have it. Someone beat up Harold Ziegler. You mean Ed Thurston's delivery boy? Yeah. Poor kid. I knew him well. Hurt bad? Ed beaten in badly. They don't expect him to live. Oh, what a dirty shame. Got any leads? Nothing that's worth anything. Come along, I'll show you all there is. There's his bicycle over there. And here's the weapon. Mm. Small end of an axe handle. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. Who are you flash over here? Huh? Uh-huh. What is it? Jelly beans scattered all over the place. Carol loved them. Well, what else? Apparently, he was dragged down here into this ravine. This is where they found the body. Hey, wait a minute. Throw your flash around here. Hmm. Nice footprints. Probably belong to the ambulance driver. One of them must belong to the attacker. Has homicide been notified? Yes. They're on their way out. Well, when they get here, see if they don't disturb those footprints. I've got a hunch I can find a fellow whose shoes fit some of those prints. And if I get him, I want to be able to make a comparison. You mean you've got this case solved already? No, not yet. But I've got a strong suspicion, and I don't want those big flat feet from headquarters ruining these prints. But the homicide boys are assigned to the case. I know, but this happened on my beat. And I know the ins and outs of this neighborhood better than the headquarters boys. And I knew Harold Ziegler. I want to crack this case my way. I may need your help. How about it? I'm with you, Bill. Okay. Guard those footprints and don't say anything about my hunch. I'm going down to the hospital to see if I can get anything out of Harold. The poor kid's still alive. Good evening, Officer Hyde. Oh, hello, Edith. You got that Ziegler kid in here, the one that was beaten up? Yes. I'd like to ask him some questions, if I may. You can go back, but I doubt if you can find out anything. The boy's unconscious. His mother and father are there with him. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening. May I talk to the boy? Yes, but I don't think he can hear you. He's very low. Harold. Harold. It's Bill White, the motor cop. Harold, who hit you? Harold, I've got to know who did it. Can't you hear me, Harold? Harold, 
Can't you tell me? Just tell me his name. It's no use, officer. He's dead. Later that night, Patrolman Bill White unfolds his theory to Officer Glaze and Mr. Thurston in the back room of Thurston's drugstore. Now, here's the hunch I want you to help me on, Glaze. Shoot. Remember about a year ago, a Japanese gardener was beaten up and robbed over in Herman? Yes. Yeah. Well, that Japanese was beaten the same way that Harold was. Same kind of a club. And for the same motive, robbery. I still don't see how that proves the same person did it, Bill. Well, Mr. Thurston, that's a principle we use in police work. We found out that the modus operandi, or method of committing a crime, is a trademark of any particular criminal. He always goes about his dirty work in the same way. But my conviction is deeper than merely superficial similarities. I worked on that Japanese case. Oh, you did? Yes, sir. And I found out that it was pulled by three young thugs. One of them was a 20-year-old, good-for-nothing, who lives over in Herman. His name's Walter Smith. The second was Red Thomas, aged 18. And the third, the one who swung the club on the Japanese... Well, I couldn't get a line on him for a long time. Then I got a tip from a butcher over on Avenue 57 that he was reasonably certain that a 17-year-old kid by the name of Louis Bundy, who was driving his meat wagon, had conked the Japanese. I started to check up on this Bundy kid, and I finally got him on a robbery of a delivery station for a downtown department store. You mean that villa to Paris, John? That's right. He pleaded guilty. But some social workers had him put on probation. So he went scot-free with a grudge against me. Now, I know about every kid in this district, and uh, though some of them get into jams occasionally, there are only three who are thoroughly vicious hoodlums, and they're Smith, Thomas, and Bundy. This job tonight was the work of someone familiar with the neighborhood. Whoever did it knew your organization, Mr. Thurston, and he knew the neighborhood well enough to give you the address of a vacant house for the delivery. What? Yeah, I checked on the address. That house has been vacant for three weeks. But to commit murder for $19.50... Yeah, it's a lot of money to a 17-year-old boy. Well, as far as that goes, I can't very well afford to lose it myself. We'll get it back for you, Mr. Thurston. Is there anything that misses in my reconstruction of the case? Nothing that I can see. It checks all right. Fine. We let Homicide do whatever it likes, Glaze, and you and I will work on Bundy and his pals. Mm-hmm. Early the next morning, Glaze and White returned to the scene of the crime equipped with plaster of Paris. The footprints are still intact in the rapidly drying mud, and the officers quickly make casts of all the impressions. The elimination of the prints begins. One pair belongs to Mr. Thurston, another to his companion of the preceding evening, another to the ambulance driver. At last, there remains but one pair of unidentified prints, the impression of a shoe with new cat's paw rubber heels. White and Glaze take these to the neighborhood cobbler at Pasadena Avenue and Avenue 43. Ah, uh, good morning, gentlemen. Hello, Tony. Uh, what's that you got in your hand? Huh? That's a plaster cast of a shoe print. Hmm. I may never see anything like that before. Well, take a good look at it. Ah, she's a, just like a white shoe, huh? That's right, Tony. Now, look carefully. Is that your work? Did you mend this pair of shoes recently? Hey, golly. Uh, this is my work. Uh, see these uh, nail holes. Uh, look at this hammer. Uh, she's uneven. What? Can you imagine that? These look like new heels, Tony. Did you put them on? Oh, I put on the heels. Who did you do this for? Well, uh, let me think. Um, oh, sure. I do it for that uh, Bundy kid. Uh, uh, Louis Bundy. Louis Bundy? Well, what do you say, Glaze? I say your hunches are great things. Familiar with the habits of the boys who frequently go to Sycamore Grove to play tennis, Glaze and White park their motorcycles some distance from Sycamore Grove and approaching it by a circuitous route, finally arrive at a point on the hill where they can watch the tennis courts without being seen. They remain secreted for half an hour before anyone appears. And then Bundy approaches the park from the railroad tracks. A little later, Red Thomas joins him and shortly after the Smith boy shows up. They sit in huddled conversation for several minutes while the officers watch. Now, what do you suppose the conference is about? Yeah, probably planning some more devilment. I wish we were close enough to hear what they're saying. Yeah. Well, it's all over anyway. There goes Bundy to play tennis. Now, what do we do? We'll start on Thomas. Look, he's getting a ride on a bakery truck. That truck's next stop is Steiner's Grocery in Highland Park. 
I'm going to take my motorcycle and meet it when it gets there. You go back to Green's hardware store. I'll meet you there. Well, as far as I go for a while, kid. Now, this is fine. Thanks for the lift. Don't mention it. Hello, Red. Huh? Well, what do you want? You. What for? Oh, I want to ask you a few questions. What for? I ain't done nothing. We'll see about that. Well, I don't see what you... Yeah, want to come along peacefully or shall I put you under arrest? Oh, all right. Officer White takes Red Thomas back to Green's hardware. And there, locked in the basement, he questions him for a long time. Now, Red, where were you yesterday afternoon and evening? I told you half a dozen times. I was down at the pool room all afternoon. What time did you get home? Oh, about seven o'clock. Where were you at 6.30? I don't know. Probably still at the pool room or on my way home. Weren't you with Lewis Bundy? No. Why? What were you talking to Bundy and Walter Smith about this morning? Oh, I don't know. Just talking. Well, what were you talking about? There well, ain't no law against talking to a couple of pals, is there? No, but when the conversation is regarding a murder... Then I want to know about it. Murder? What murder? You know very well what murder. The murder of Harold Ziegler last night. Now, I'm going to arrest you and Smith and Bundy for that little job. Listen, White. I didn't have anything to do with that. No? Well, how are you going to prove that? I don't know, but it's God's own truth. I didn't have nothing to do with it. I swear it. Who did it? I... I can't squeal. Well, you'd better. I found Lewis Bundy's shoe prints at the scene of the crime, and I know he's in on it. Well, maybe he is, but I'm not. Start talking. Oh, right. All right, I'll tell you what I know about it. Go ahead. Well, we was up to Sycamore Grove yesterday, and Bundy said he wished he knew how to get some money, and Smith suggested we write a phony check for 15 or $20 and get the butcher to send some meat, COD, to a vacant house somewhere, and then get the delivery boy to cash the phony check. <laughs> and you thought you could get away with that. Gee, you punks are dumb. I knew we couldn't get away with it. I told him it was forgery, and I didn't want any part of it, so I beat it. I don't know what they did after that. When we met down at the Grove this morning, Smith and I both accused Bundy of killing that Ziegler kid, and he denied it. Oh, gosh, that's all I know. And that's plenty. Oh, will you let me go now? And let you warn your pals, not a chance. The only place I'll let you go is to jail. A little while later, Walter Smith is arrested as he tries to make a getaway from his home. In the store basement, White questioned him. Here's the same story as he had heard from Red Thomas. I swear to God I didn't have anything to do with Crook and Harold. When Red pointed out that Lewis's check plan was forgery, I backed out too. I, I, I don't want to get mixed up on a penitentiary rap. So you didn't have anything to do with that murder, eh? No, sir. I didn't know anything about it until I read in this morning's paper about Harold being dead. That's why I went over to the Grove to see Bundy. He denied it, of course, but... I've got a hunch he did it. And so have I, my young informer. Retaining the two youths in custody, White and Blaze start out after Lewis Bundy. In a vacant house across the street from the Bundy home, they lie in wait for their prey. It is 11 o'clock in the evening before the circumstantially accused murderer comes home. From their hiding place, they see him bid his parents good night and retire to his bedroom. Then the two officers cross the street and ring the doorbell. Mrs. Bundy answers the door. Yes? Uh, we're police officers, ma'am. We want to talk to Lewis. Oh, what are you going to do with my boy now? I just want to ask him a few questions. But he's gone to bed. Somebody raised a window in that other room, Bill. Get in there fast. Now, look here. You can't come to a person's house. All right, Lewis. Up with your hands. I want the big idea. That's what we want to know. <clears throat> These cuffs will keep you from opening any more windows. Oh, what is it, Louis? What have you done now? I don't know, Mom. I ain't done nothing. Oh, Louis, why must you always be getting into trouble? I've tried so hard. Now, Mrs. Bundy, if you'll just not get excited. I've got to ask your son some questions. Where were you last night, Louis? Mm. Last night? I don't know. Around. Around where? Oh, down at the corner, hanging around. Look at this, Bill. A shirt. It's been washed. But there's still some brown stains on it. Hmm. What are these stains, Lewis? I don't know. I'll bet you five bucks they're blood. And you better not. You'd lose your money. Where are the shoes Tony put new heels on last week? Oh, no. Well, they wasn't no good, so I threw them away. Where? Uh, in in the incinerator. I burned them. Take a look for them out there, Glaze, while I escort Lewis to Lincoln Heights. Now you got me here in jail, maybe you'll tell me what you're arresting me for. Gladly. 
The charge is murder. Ah, you're kidding. No, on the level, Lewis. You see, it's this way. Last night, about 6.30, you mur- uh, murdered Harold Zeiger. We know all about it. Don't try to bluff me, copper. I'm not. But apparently, I have to convince you. Last night, when you beat that poor kid's skull in, you left your heel prints in the mud. Today, Tony the cobbler identified those prints as having been made by the heels he put on your shoe. Then we picked up your two pals, Smith and Thomas, and they both talked plenty. Yeah? Yeah. Now, after I booked you, I'm going back to your house and turn it upside down until I find the $19 and a half you stole from Harold. And the shoes you said you burned, but the glaze couldn't find in the incinerator. And the blood-stained clothing. I've got a little hunch about them. I think you probably buried them in the cellar. I'm going to dig down there until I find listen, them. Listen, listen, White. Do me a favor and don't do that. Why not? Well, well, just don't. I don't want my mother bothered no more. Hey, Leo, Fatten, I'll tell you the whole story. Well, let's have it. Well, you promise not to bother my mother? I'll try not to. Well, you see, it's this way. I got a girl up in Ventura, see? Well, she's coming down to L.A. for the holiday, see? So I wanted to get her a Christmas present and show her a good time. Only I ain't got no coin, see? Well, Smith and Red backed out on me, so I figured I'd pull a job alone. I'm sorry old man Tyson sent Harold on that phony errand because I like the kid. I hadn't planned to kill nobody, but there was nothing else I could do. What do you mean? Well, I met Harold near the hill at Mommy and Wade, see? And I spoke to him, figuring he wouldn't be able to make me out in the dark. But he turned on his flashlight and he recognized me. And then I knew I'd have to kill him or he totally took the money away from him. So I let him have it with the axe handle. He thought I wanted his flashlight because he kept telling me I could have it if I didn't beat him no more. But I kept on beating him until he didn't make no more noise. And I took the money and I got away from there fast. And you went home and buried the bloody pants and the shoes and the money in the cellar? Not the money. What happened to it? Well, I... I... Dropped it while I was running away. A nice story. A nice Christmas present for Harold's mother. Her son's caught. I couldn't help it. I had to kill him. It was him or me. White returns to the Bundy home and starts digging in the cellar. He recovers the bloody coat and trousers, the bloody shoes, which match perfectly the plaster cast he had made at the murder scene. One thing he cannot find is the money and Lewis doubtly maintained that he had dropped it while making his getaway. On Christmas Day, White, seeking to unravel this last shred of evidence, drops into Thurston's drugstore. Hello, Bill. Hello, Mr. Thurston. How's the case coming along? Fine, except for one thing. What's that? The money. Bundy claims he dropped it, making his getaway. Now, I think he's lying, but I can't get a line on him. I wish I could return that to you for a Christmas present. Well, to tell you the truth, so do I. I got a plan. If you're willing to lend me the same amount of money... What? Just for a few hours. Sort of the old gypsy trick, making money produce more money. Well, whatever you say... Now, here's what I want you to do. Give me 1950 in the same denomination you gave Harold that night and put it in a purse as nearly like the one he had as you can find. All right, but I don't understand what for. Another hunch, Mr. Thurston. You'll find out soon enough. Half an hour later, Officer White enters Bundy's cell in the city jail. Merry Christmas, Lewis. Yeah? I don't see nothing so merry about it. Boy, I think it's plenty merry. I've discovered what a liar you are, and as a result, I'm able to give a couple of old people some Christmas cheer. What are you talking about? This purse with the 1950 in it. The Thurston's need that money, and I'm going to return it to them this afternoon. Oh. Oh, so you found it then? Yes, in spite of your constant lying. You didn't throw it away. You buried it in the cellar. That's right, but you can't blame me for lying. I figured if you overlooked it, I could give the money to my folks later. Yeah. Your folks wouldn't want blood money. No, I guess it's better you found it. Sure it is. Now, look, Lewis. Drop those blues. How'd you like a turkey dinner and then a visit out home, eh? Gee, you mean it? Sure I do. My gosh, I believe you're a human being after all, White. After a big Christmas dinner, Officer White takes Lewis Bundy home and permits him to visit with his mother. Then he leads him down to the cellar. Well, Lewis, before we go back to jail, I'd like you to show me how you buried all that stuff. I found it all anyways, but I'd like to get your movements clear in my mind. Uh, Sure. Now, here's your shovel. Well, after I got home, I stripped out of my coat and pants and shoes and brought them down here. I dug a hole right here. 
And I buried the clothes in the shoes, and then I covered over the hole. And then I went over here under the steps, and I dug another hole to bury the money in. Say, what is this? What I've been looking for, Lewis. Thurston's money. And that purse you showed me down at the jail... The decoy. Thanks for showing me where the money was, Lewis. Why, you dirty, low-down, double-crossing... Officer Bill White thus was able to return to the Thurston's the stolen money as well as the decoy that same Christmas day. Chief Sebastian recognizes the excellent single-handed job of police work done by White, promoted him to a lieutenancy in the detective force, a position which he held for 16 years until his retirement. Louis Bundy, who brutally took the life of a fellow man, was hanged at San Quentin, and his two pals, having assisted the investigation and convinced the authorities of their innocence, were released. Thank you, Chief Davis. Ladies and gentlemen, would you like to know how we write and rehearse these Calling All Cars broadcasts? You will find the full illustrated story in the latest issue of the Calling All Cars News, now being given away to everyone who asks everywhere Rio Grande cracked gasoline is sold. True detective stories in every issue, telling how cases were solved by the police departments who use Rio Grande cracked gasoline. We invite you to use the same gasoline that has been selected above all others, everywhere it is sold to power more police, fire, and emergency cars than any other brand. Every boy and girl is interested in detective work. And at no cost to you, you can give some fortunate youngster a complete detective outfit of 14 valuable free gifts. Easterners will be glad to know that all Rio Grande dealers carry Sinclair motor oils. Throughout the East and Middle West, Sinclair motor oils are widely known as the oil that's mellowed millions of years. You've seen pictures of the giant Sinclair dinosaurs that symbolize the age of Sinclair motor oil. Now, these famous oils are available throughout the Pacific Coast and Far West, distributed by the Rio Grande Oil Company through thousands of independent dealers. We guarantee that you can't buy better motor oils at any price than Sinclair, and your Rio Grande dealer will tell you the scientifically exact grade to use for your car. Police calling all cars. Attention all cars to cancellation broadcast 142. Suspect in this case now in custody. That's all. Rolls and foot. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsley. Bidding you good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company.